what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> Have you ever asked that question to yourself, to God, out loud? When bad things happen, as they do to us all, often the first reaction is, why me? What have I done to deserve this? If we are especially caring, as I hope we are, we might even ask that about another person. In some cases, we think that we're certain that what someone has done deserves a cruel fate. In Jesus' day, people were absolutely certain that illness, poverty, and so on was deserved, brought on by one's sins or the sins of their ancestors. Recall the time when Jesus' disciples asked, who sinned, this man born blind or his parents? Heartbreak is a universal part of human life. A bad diagnosis, a lost job, a failed relationship, painful or untimely death. Who deserves tragedy? One day, the followers of Jesus came to tell him about a tragic event. They had heard that the victims were brutally murdered at the order of Pilate while worshiping, while worshiping in the holy temple, and their blood was mingled with the blood of the sacrifices. Jesus, in turn, asked his followers a question about this temple massacre and about another disaster. In the second disaster, a tower in the wall of Jerusalem collapsed, killing 18 persons, apparently innocent persons, who deserved either situation? Jesus asked his friends, were their sins worse? Were these victims any worse than the others? Is that why this happened to them? To which he emphatically answers no. Now often when Jesus asks a question, we're left without an answer. We kind of have to figure it out. But Jesus this time answers no. There is no cause and effect in operation. The worst sin on earth does not mean that someone will have or deserves to have the worst life on earth. Bad things happen to good people. And conversely, good things happen to bad. Well, things don't seem to have changed very much in the 2,000 years. We can see similarities to some modern-day catastrophes. Bombings in the black churches, attacks in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and most recently, the mosques in Christ Church, New Zealand. Safe places, places of worship, and workplaces in New York City and Kansas City, and schools in Sandy Hook and Columbine and Parkland, safe places. Who deserves to be a victim of those events? And what about the children of Baltimore City who die by violence and their grieving families? Who deserves that? Who deserves to go to schools that are not physically adequate, that are not safe, and that have few resources? Who deserves to be poor or hungry or lonely? And the list goes on. Who deserves that? So here's the question. If we don't get what we deserve, what do we deserve as human beings? When I think of deserving something or not deserving it, especially during this time of Lent, the issue of forgiveness bubbles right up to the top for me. You've heard it said, and you may believe that some actions are so horrific that they cannot be forgiven that the perpetrator does not deserve forgiveness. What do you think? Well, listen to this story. At the age of 10, 
Twins Eva and Miriam were taken to Auschwitz, where Dr. Josef Mengele used them for medical experiments. On the website, The Forgiveness Project, Eva Kaur describes details of some of these brutal, dehumanizing experiments, which I will spare you today. But then she goes on to continue after talking about her experience at Auschwitz. On the 27th of January, 1945, four days before my 11th birthday, Auschwitz was liberated by the Soviet army. After nine months in refugee camps, I returned to my village in Romania to find no one from my family had survived. Decades later, 1993, she was invited to lecture to some doctors in Boston and was asked if she could bring a Nazi doctor with her. She thought this was an insane request, but then she remembered she had once been in a documentary and on a panel with a doctor named Dr. Hans Munk, who was from Auschwitz. So she contacted him in Germany, and he said he would meet with her for a videotaped interview to take to the conference. She wanted to find some way to thank him for that. She said in her desperate effort to find a meaningful thank you gift for Dr. Munk, I searched the stores and my heart for many months. Then the idea of a forgiveness letter came to my mind, she says. I knew it would be a meaningful gift, but it became a gift to myself as well because I realized I was not a powerless, hopeless victim. So on the 27th of January, 1995, at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, I stood by the ruins of the gas chamber with my children and Dr. Monk and his children and grandchildren. And Dr. Monk signed his document about the operation of the gas chambers while I read my document of forgiveness and signed it. As I did that, I felt a burden of pain was lifted from me. I was no longer in the grip of hate. I was finally free. Can you even begin to imagine that scene? But then what got me as I was listening to her story, or reading it, the day I forgave the Nazis privately I forgave my parents, whom I hated all my life for not having saved me from Auschwitz. Children expect their parents to protect them. Mine couldn't. And then I forgave myself for hating my parents. She goes on to say a couple of things that just have meant so much to me over these last few weeks. Forgiveness is really nothing more than an act of self-healing and self-empowerment. I call it a miracle medicine, a miracle medicine. It's free, it works, and it has no side effects. <laughs> it's a miracle medicine. Forgiveness is as personal, Eva Kaur says, as chemotherapy. I do it for myself. I do it not because they deserve it, but because I deserve it. At the end, she says she forgave the Nazi doctors, not because they deserved it, but because she did. So my friends, today could be a good day, an opportune time to take a small step in the process of forgiveness. Begin, just begin to forgive someone. Begin, just to be begin to forgive yourself. You deserve it. Amen. <laughs>